I was after my father. Please, there's a deadline. I need to be in Ahmedabad by this date, and you need to book train tickets and all of that. My father didn't <laughs> till the last day. He didn't, and then I packed my bags, and my parents were like, uh, "Who's going where?" And I was like, "I have a train to catch." And my father's like, "But I didn't book the train." And I was like, "You know, we'll take a flight." And back in that day, like. We never traveled uh, mm. via flight. At least in my family, we hadn't, and it was very expensive. So my father's like, "No." We reached the station, um, and the last train to Odisha was leaving in front of my eyes, okay. and uh, the last train to Ahmedabad because that's where the initiation happened was leaving in front of my eyes, and I cried, and I told my father, "I have to, have to, I must go to Ahmedabad." And then we went to this room where there were a bunch of TT sitting, and I think they were intoxicated. But my father tried talking to them that my, you know, this is the situation my daughter needs to go. They're like, there's only one way she can go. She can take this train to Udaipur, and then catch a bus from Udaipur to Ahmedabad. Mm. But otherwise, like in the stipulated time, she can't make it to Ahmedabad. And I just heard it. And while my parents were still talking to the TTs, I got into the train and I just sat. I sat. I clutched my bags, and I was just sitting and waiting for the train to move. But because I didn't have a ticket, it was risky, and I was traveling alone, and it was a train in the night. Um, and then my mom started saying, <laughs> "Today I am joined by Mansi Kabla, a dear friend and a woman I have known for more than 30 years. She is a lighthouse and my go-to person for feedback and criticism." Mansi works as an associate director and a storyteller at the Good Business Lab. Prior to GBL, she worked in rural livelihoods and developments in Burkina Faso. She is the founder of Angai, a social enterprise located in rural Odisha that utilizes local resources to produce handmade soaps and supports the livelihood of tribal women. We arrive at multiple crossroads in life with two choices: should and must. Her story is an example of choosing must. In this conversation we talk about her life in the countryside in a remote village located in the red belt of Odisha. We delve deep into her journey of building Angai. We convene about the sense of time in the countryside and the city and so much more. This spirited conversation is not only for someone looking to venture into the development sector but also for people looking to live an intentional life please bear with the sounds of the bells of the street vendors in the podcast i hope you enjoy this conversation with the lively and gritty mansi kabra mansi thank you for coming to tiny farm friends podcast and For listeners who do not know who you are, so I just give you a brief, give a brief introduction about you, how I met you. So I shifted to Delhi in class nine, mm-hmm. and I think since then you've been a dear friend and somebody who I look up to. Maybe people could call us or maybe label us into the nerd gang somehow, but we were not actually nerds in school. We were. Generalist since then also, and I think you were somebody who was teachers' favorite and. Maybe going for debates and stuff like that. And I, you were somebody I always looked up to. And apart from that, when we were making this shift towards a new life in Rishikesh, you were part of my believers group. You know, everybody has to have like core believers, like you who support their friends. And I am really thankful for that. <laughs> and so yeah, like I uh, know about you since school and. we did our high school together in delhi and so maybe you can tell us more about your story what happened after high school and what's up right now yes um so yeah i know raghav from school and um, i wouldn't categorize ourselves in the nerd gang because i think we had our fair share of fun but we were definitely um, knowledge seekers in some sense because i think besides what we were covering in school we would always be talking about you know something new that's happening or something more we should learn together as friends um and uh, so so that's like my memory of school life um and i am more fortunate that you invited me to this podcast like i was telling you i've heard 
all of your podcasts and i don't think i belong to that category of you know achievers uh, but yeah life is full of short stories and i'm happy to share a few um but yeah after school um i always wanted to get into medical but that somehow didn't happen um and then i ended up doing economic honors um at src yeah, I, i have a faint image of you know wearing that lab coat all the time now i remember that like yeah yeah i was in biology yeah. I was so sure that I wanted to become a brain surgeon um at, <laughs> back in school but I think it's interesting cuz it that was the first moment in my life where I wanted something so strongly that I studied for but somehow didn't get um and then I remember I got into SRCC for economic honors and believe it or not I hadn't heard about SRCC before then my parents were like oh it's one of the best colleges you must give up your medical dreams and go there um and it's interesting because i still didn't want to i ended up joining srcc but even in the first year i was preparing for my medical but i think it was one of those learnings in that first year that has kind of set the stage for everything that followed which is that you know you might not always get what you want um or even after putting in a lot of effort things might not materialize your way but it's not those events but it's your attitude to those events um or you know trying to understand okay if i can't do this what's more you know um on offer where i can connect the same thing so maybe mm-hmm. what i thought i would have achieved in medical there were other ways to doing that so anyways i did economic honors for 3 years in srcc and then um i was applying for jobs and i got a few uh, but i was also lucky that sbi youth for india um fellowship got relaunched that year so they i think they the first cohort um came back in like 2013 and then they stopped it for 2 years and then they relaunched it um and i applied uh, for the sbi youth for india fellowship which was basically this developmental program that was designed to expose you know students or like development learners like us us to what the rural india has to offer and you know how do projects uh, get panned and i at that point was just interested in figuring out what i want to do next i was not confused but i was very sure i did not know what i want which is a way of is a state of confusion and then i joined the fellowship um and i remember our initiation happened sorry i like to interrupt you here mm-hmm. like we, i believe that we are always at the crossroads of you know what we should do or we must do even after school like when we do maybe even in school like in 11 that's the first crossroad we face like yeah. what field to choose science commerce humanities yeah. and then we are again at the crossroads after like passing out from uh, school yeah. like again medical economic honors and then i'm sure like after doing economic honors from such an esteemed college yeah. where you because mostly people go there because they hear about the packages that they get mm. so what made you you know take that part in the first place like choosing sbi fellowship or was it something that you always wanted to do like work in a rural area or development area or for a cause mm. or what were your thoughts during that crossroads and mm. what made you choose mm. the fellowship i think that's a good question i remember thinking at that point you know given the nature of jobs on offer and the companies that were coming for placement they were very established well established structures of which you would have been a part somewhere in the hierarchy um and sure like you would have learned a lot and a lot of my peers have but my hesitation or the inertia i had was just this inability to want to be a part of a system without knowing how it was created Mm-hmm. so i always kind of wanted to you know live the journey end to end so i was hoping to be to join an organization or some kind of a work that allowed me to see what the initial stages are like of building something mm-hmm. anything mm-hmm. um and i didn't find that many opportunities of you know working in startups back at that time or you know i couldn't match what i had to offer with what people were looking for Ironically now I work for a startup which has been great uh, which I'll tell you later about but at that point I felt the stakes were not so high so it's not like one decision you know that my life rided on that one decision so I could be a bit more less risk averse or more risk loving and so I wanted to just see 
what all there is on offer and what is going to open more options for me later instead of marrying myself to a system not just in my choice of doing a job but also mentally like you know mm -hmm. getting into that rhythm which i now realize is very difficult to break unless you can put a conscious effort so at that point i think it was more about i wanted to learn with an open mind you know not be under a pressure of i don't know deadlines or mm -hmm. productivity or like you know proving something or making the business grow and all of that made me just like search for options that were you know a little unstructured mm -hmm. and sbi fellowship um, you know people may have like their thoughts on whether such development programs need to be more structured and you know things have improved since but when i joined it was little unstructured because mm -hmm. it was just their second cohort like i said which allowed us the freedom to design our experience ourselves so the only brief that we were given at that point was that you know we filled in this form on like what you're interested to do and at that point i had already done a lot of like voluntary activities with you know ngos in delhi my parents are from rajasthan so i had a bit of exposure of you know going every summer vacation to my mom's house in ajmer or my father's village back in golapra um so i wanted to work with communities that that was something that was clear and what sbi foundation did was they gave us a form we filled up few of our interest areas i put in rural development women empowerment in there um and then i got posted to this um ngo called gram vikas in odisha um which is i think one of N india's biggest ngos working in water and sanitation right. um and so there were i think four or five of us who got posted to that uh, that ngo um and i got posted to a district called koinpur which was in gajapati in odisha um and it was very remote mm -hmm. it was also the red belt area so you know frequented by naxalites and been under under unrest um but so in the beginning when i got posted there with nanoshka uh, one of my colleagues we were very um, taken aback by just what we had come into um just because there was everything that you needed to live a basic life was there but there was no internet there was no network for the longest time i couldn't speak to my parents or you know stay connected which in the beginning we romanticized or oh, you know being in nature and all of that and then later we also kind of you know realized had its like setbacks but all in all my biggest learning in my time in odisha uh working with gram vikas and then later starting my own enterprise um angai was that the sensation of time is so different when you're in a place that has no network that you're able to utilize every minute mm. every second because you're not kind of you know distracted so like i said there was enough to live a comfortable living but not enough to live a luxurious living and in that space between comfort and luxury i found time i found time to do things time to learn about um you know things that were happening outside of the cities it was in one of such visits that i remember i visited this village called arsilingi mm -hmm. which was on this one remote location in the gajapati district and there was literally the size of the village was 46 or 50 families like not more than that um and they their entire livelihood of that village was just a bunch of fragmented activities one of which was selling oil seeds right. um and this is where i segue into talking But about angai so like you tell us more about angai i would want to know what were your expectations when you were you know like when you got to know okay you being posted here and mm. this is the line of work and it's a red belt area and what the media portrays about such areas mm. so what are some stereotypes already established by media or generally mm. uh, because of the political situations mm. what was your imagination about that place expectations about that place and when you reached there how different was it mm. so in terms of our expectations quite frankly we went with very low expectations mm. because the day we decided all of us that in that cohort to do the sbi fellowship we knew the list of areas we could potentially get posted to mm. um so and the you know initial workshops we had which was in ahmedabad to kind of initiate us into the fellowship they were programmed to 
you know lower our expectations be ready for whatever is to come so in that way i do want to accolade sbi foundation for their design of the program in such a way that didn't let us get bogged down by the rhetoric or the narrative that the media presented with odisha of course like my image of it being you know one of the poorest states um in the country i did have some knowledge of how the nutrition might not be like you know um up to the mark but that also was married with the you know this curiosity to like then want to figure out why certain things are not working you must have had a pretty good idea after the initiation and everything but what was your family's reaction to it oh uh, my, going to my family this? flipped they are like people go people from rural areas aspire to come to urban areas for jobs and you're really like reversing the wheel like you know you want to go and quite frankly i wasn't alone a lot of people i mm. remember in my friend circle were trying to go for these offbeat things just because of the experience and just because you know you could take that up that chance so for me actually it was a great exercise in building a stamina to talk with my parents on mm. what exactly were their worries and then kind of like you know addressing them one by one because the more you talk to them at the end of it it comes to like you know their view of life and happiness and all of that and for me at that point i needed very basic things to be happy in life because i was just beginning to understand life and right. both personally professionally all of that so i felt i didn't have much to lose my parents were more worried about the remuneration because we used to get like 13000 a month mm. back then which was not enough at all but interesting interestingly i never spent more than 3000 a month there so percentage perspective i was saving way more than i save today by living in these areas so it was difficult to convince my parents because they had a, a view of life they imagined for you know their kids but it wasn't that difficult when i started relaying back stories to them once i was there it's interesting but my i don't know if you want to cover this in the podcast but my journey from delhi to odisha was one of the most life changing journeys ever because i remember at back in those days i didn't have a card to book train tickets and all of that so i was after my father please there's a deadline i need to be in ahmedabad by this date and you need to book train tickets and all of that and my father didn't <laughs> till the last day he didn't and then i packed my bags and my parents were like uh, who's going where and i was like i have a train to catch in my father's like but i didn't book the train and i was like you know we'll take a flight and back in that day like we never traveled mm. uh, via flight at least in my family we hadn't and it was very expensive so my father's like no we reached the station um and the last train to odisha was leaving in front of my eyes okay. and uh, the last train to ahmedabad because that's where the initiation happened was leaving in front of my eyes and i cried and i told my father i have to have to i must go to ahmedabad and then we went to this room where there were a bunch of tt sitting and i think they were intoxicated but my father tried talking to them that my you know this is the situation my daughter needs to go they were like there's only one way she can go she can take this train to udaipur and then catch a bus from udaipur to ahmedabad mm. but otherwise like in the stipulated time she can't make it to ahmedabad and i just heard it and while my parents were still talking to the tts i got into the train and i just sat i sat i clutched my bags and i was just sitting and waiting for the train to move but because i didn't have a ticket it was risky and i was traveling alone and it was a train in the night um and then my mom started saying <laughs> bhajans and you know like started praying which is interesting a uh, slight detour to the conversation but i am not a believer like when in the toughest of moments i try to rationalize but i i don't i don't think i have go whenever i am in the toughest of moments i always ask my mom to pray because i know she is a believer <laughs> so anyway she in direct way of teaching god yeah because i know if she reaches he he might or she might listen but anyway she started praying my brother was there he was also feeling very like you know nervous and as i sat in the train there was this uncle who came sat next to me and i think he witnessed the entire scene play out he didn't know any one of us and he's like are you running away i was like no this train is going to take me to udaipur i'm not running away from delhi to udaipur i have to go to ahmedabad and i think in the most vulnerable of moment you feel like sharing you know um, and so i told him this is the situation and he's like i have a ticket you can take mine 
and you know you don't have to worry and i was like no no you know we'll we'll make it work the train started off um the tt one of the tts who was drunk he came he saw me and he said that oh your parents uh, you know told me about your situation you're going to depot you come to my cabin mm. like whatever wherever he had seat because he is like i spoke to your parents and i got very scared at that point mm. um and that uncle who was sitting next to me he's like my uncle mama ho like i'm his un- i'm her uncle and she's going with me and then he said no i know her parents left her here and i didn't say anything but because this entire thing was happening in front of everyone in that overcrowded general compartment mm. no one could question him. yeah okay. no one could question no. you know the uncle and i said yeah he's my mama so the tt left so i felt like he was an angel in disguise that way because i don't know what would have happened that mm-hmm. night and then later in the bus night i still remember he gave me his seat he took a napkin he put it on the floor and he slept on that napkin and that napkin wasn't even so sweet. and he had to get off a station before me but he waited to like you know drop me off till udaipur and in the middle like he could see i was getting nervous so he took out a picture and he showed me the picture of his two young daughters and he said i'm a family man you don't have to be scared you know trains make you meet people and like you know share stories and you'll be fine and long story short i made it to um, ahmedabad i think minutes before midnight so now do you think it was all worth it <laughs> oh for sure for sure i think that trip that journey in the train energized me it energized me into developing an attitude towards you know problems um building a not a belief i would say but trust in yourself that no problem is you know unsolvable and the fact that if you really want to do something things have a habit of working out mm-hmm. or you know situations will align for so it to on happen this i recently heard a really good conversation it was between which role and mel robbins on mm-hmm. the podcast and she talked about this popeye episode i don't know if you remember uh, if you used to watch popeye yeah, so yeah. there's popeye olive and i think the baby was sweet pea or something bruto the villain yeah right. <laughs> so in this episode they talk about uh, the episode in which the baby when popeye and bruto whatever his name was they're fighting and he ends up on a construction site Oh, and they keep fighting, and the baby is just going from one floor to another. Yeah. But as soon as he's about to fall, Popeye comes. and I no, not Popeye, an I beam comes ah. to save him. And again, when he's about to fall, another I beam comes. So similarly, in life, when you're trying to pursue something, and when you're in such situations, hmm. somehow an I beam comes to help you out. So maybe in that situation, that uncle was your I beam. Yes, and he literally like. Uh, yeah made you reach amdavad on time so mm. it's an exciting story now coming back to odisha yes and so i would love to know more about odisha also because mm. i somehow feel it has so many hidden se- secrets and it is mostly known for you know extracting minerals and stuff but mm. i think that is a place that maybe in future people will start appreciating mm. because of its hidden beauty which has not been explored tourism wise also not mm. to that extent like how other states are mm. so what were your experiences in odisha and what was your role like there mm. as a fellowship student mm. so i am not an expert in mm. odisha so i can't mm. tell you much about the country beyond what i have experienced mm. and read about um like i said it's rich in resources but also the rural hinterlands there's almost this image of you know odisha being impoverished mm. but what gets hidden in those narratives is just how hard working those people are because to survive in such harsh conditions really requires physical strength and also grit mm. so in that way i think my you know overall whoever i met in my time there i it has been like a bunch of colorful stories you know strung together in a bead i i keep in a string keep i keep with myself in terms of the fellowship um the expectation from fellows was very simple you will be placed in locations um with a partner ngo and you can either work with the ngo in you know continuing their activities improving them or scaling them up 
or you could identify a gap in the system in the community that you're living and create a project to you know overcome that and then SBI foundation could you know support you with it so we had many options um, at our disposal and in my cohort fellows went in all directions there were fellows who you know worked with NGO not only during the fellowship but even after uh, there were fellows who got great exposure in for instance you know teaching uh, kids because one of the most common elements in all of these rural areas is there were a lot of kids whether they were going to school or not but there were each um, each village that we were posted in um, is full of kids so a lot of fellows experimented with different teaching methods you know be it in their free time and whatnot what I did was like I said I was in the beginning trying to help Gram Vikas um, in their you know some flagship programs but in one of those visits um, I got to you know meet the women of Arsilingi and what I learned about that village was that their primary livelihood at least of the women was that they would sell oil seeds mm. and oil we Not know oil seeds like Is it particular oil yeah they had indigenous trees like okay. Tulo, Mahua and all okay. of that so they would you know either like sell very rudimentary products from so who, who was buying those oil seeds local market uh, all local market what use? so they would like buy those oil seeds to obviously like take out oil and then it was part of like a big supply chain okay. um so you know from the village it would go to the nearby town and then they would like kind of distribute it you know all over odisha for cooking purposes for industrial purposes you know depending on the oil and all of that but that's exactly what you know i got exposure to that this whole supply chain is so huge and these women are at the you know one end extreme end of it and they're really not earning much but people at the end of the but that's all at yes, the end of the yes, supply yes. chain are but that's also like just how systems are created so at that point i didn't want to question the system or try to do something very revolutionary but i just said that for years you're doing this at least move one step above you know and then we can see what we want to do so i started meeting those women very regularly i kind of saw the amount of you know oil seeds and that they were collecting um you know what pattern in what moments in the year would they collect would they sell would they earn how would they use their earnings etc and because there was no internet i didn't have much to ideate but like you know just like think to myself but this one day i made a trip to parlekha mundi which is the closest town Mm. Um, and then I just I sat on the internet searching for hours on like what products can you make from oil in a low skilled manner so that it wouldn't be very overwhelming. So you went to a to, cyber cafe. Or I went to a cyber <laughs> cafe in Parlekha Mundi. Uh, I became best friends with that person later because as the story unfolds, we were able to establish Anga, which I'll tell you. And I had to go a lot for marketing purposes there. And then the next stage in my life after Anga, which was masters, I. Could, it was only thanks to that cyber cafe that I could, you know, work through my documents. But anyway, so there was literally just one cyber cafe in Parlekha Mundi, and um, um, it's interesting. But even the dialect that I had learned of speaking Odisha in my time there was so different than what they spoke in the towns, because mine was a little bit, you know, mixed. Odia and Sora, which was the you tribal started, language. Uh, like speaking some Odia words. Yeah, yeah. Who I learned full Hindi. Odia. Hindi. Did people? No one in spoke in Hindi in that village because that's what we have to realize. You are very far away from the city, so no one spoke Hindi. No one understood Hindi, and that's literally what you know allowed us to, in some sense, like learn their language, mm -hmm. um, which then became our own. And I remember Ninoshka, my friend, and I. We learned it from the kids. Because it was very difficult to ask women to teach us because they were so busy. But we used to live in a tribal residential girls hostel. Nanashka and I had a very small room. And um, in the evenings we would, you know, play games with the kids. And almost how we learned Hindi growing up, like there not being any classes, but just, you know, listening to your parents, we picked up those words. So in the beginning, everyone would actually joke. You speak like kids. I was like, yeah, because we learned from kids. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's how we learned Odia. And then when we went to the cyber, I went to the cyber cafe when I had met, you know, when I had visited Arsilingi enough to kind of have an idea of what I could start searching. So I knew that I wanted to search 
some products that could be made out of oil. Um, those products had to be low skilled. So whatever you know project we design around doesn't become too overwhelming or detached um, you know to the women's routines. Um, but I didn't know like what I would stumble upon. So one fine day I go to the cyber cafe, I search rampantly and I stumble upon this handmade cold process way of like making soaps. And that changed our life. That was because, a Eureka moment. Yeah, that was a Eureka moment because the if you understand the economy of the village I used to live in, there were a lot of tribal residential schools. And that meant that each school had at least 1500 students study and live there. So they would need soaps, mm. they would need food and the schools were procuring it, you know, from the local markets. Mm. So if you could replace, you know, this demand by like supplying soaps through women locally made in Odisha, it could actually start a tribal nationalistic movement also wherein you know it's made from local resources it's made by the mothers of the kids who are attending the school it's providing them livelihood mm. um, and so I, I really started like building castles in the air that way but what I soon realized is that I didn't know how to make soaps so I had to first teach myself um, I, I basically you know read enough blogs and like documented the different ways we could go about it um, sourced all the raw materials. Um, I would say everything except lye, which is sodium hydroxide, was available in in you know the the village. Uh, but sodium hydroxide, I sourced from Katak. Mm -hmm. I got in touch with some person, made a lot of like random cold calls. But speaking in Odia helped because they gave us discounts, and then we told them it's for you know school kids and all of that. So once I got all the materials, I first started making it in my own room in the girls' hostel. And I remember I, I put Ninoshka through it, but basically in our first batch of soaps, we had like four or five different varieties and we had to test it on ourselves. There's no way I had the money to send it to a lab. Um, and I had read enough blogs where there were mixed opinions on how, you know, you needn't always get it chemically tested. You All, all you need to make sure is that the pH is balanced. It's a slightly acidic and um, that, you know, it doesn't like leave any residue behind or it's not like you know, doesn't feel overly corrosive. Mm. So Ninoshka and I would like split each soap into two every morning, take a shower and we increase the number of our showers also <laughs> so without using too much water yeah. um, to just like test the soaps out and we finally stumbled upon a recipe that we thought would work. Mm. So I went to the village and I just one, you know, random day like spent the entire day in living their routine and I realized there were moments in their daytime where they were you know, not doing much. So it was a time where they would talk to their friends and like, you know, soul time, I would say. Mm -hmm. But I realized that time could be capitalized in making soaps while allowing the women to also mingle with each other. Um, and the, the village was very beautiful. They had like a community center, uh, which was basically empty. So we also had some space that, you know, we could utilize. So the conversation started where um, I just like I asked the women that, oh, do you, you know, you, you are free in this time. You've taught me so many things. You've taught me how to cook, you know, Odia, um, everything that I learned there. Um, is it okay if like, you know, I also like take this opportunity to uh, bring, introduce something new. And then we started speaking, speaking about like, you know, making soaps. And I said, it doesn't have to be a big thing. Like, my, my sell to them initially was this is just going to reduce your expenditure and honestly it wasn't that big of an expenditure on soaps but I never sold it as an income making activity. Right. It was just a hobby. It was something if you like we can think about what you know how we could take it forward but in the initial stages just so that there's no inertia or friction to picking it up the idea was very simple like let's just do it for fun. Let's just do it to see you know if there's enough time, if you like it, um, if you can use the product, if it's reducing expenditure. And so few women got interested and we started making the first few bunch of soaps. And it was very interesting an exercise because Tulo oil has been traditionally used in the communities uh, to prevent malaria. Um, okay. It's because it's there's like no documented proof. Repellent. Yeah, yeah, like a mosquito repellent. Uh, and there's no documented proof of it. but women have been doing it for years I mean sorry the village people living in the village have been doing it for years and they fully trust it um, 
and so when we were making soap out of that it it's like nothing was alien to them mm. even if let's say they wanted to talk about it to a women from other village they could easily speak about oh this is how it's made it's made from this oil so nothing about it was mm. alien to them as simple as that and so bunch of women started making it and then kids started taking those soaps to their school so other kids got to know which came back to their you know families to their mothers so slowly people just started talking about oh arcelingi women are making soaps and then one day when i felt like you know we had become friends we knew each other they knew i was here for a limited time um we started talking about if they really want to make a shift in their lives and actually build it as an enterprise and it has to be nothing lavish nothing you know too diverse it's just simple we're making soaps for tribal residential school children as simple as that and then um, there so were three as how many women like joined you at first and yeah was there any friction or uh, yeah Uh, so there were the village had three self help groups mm-hmm. of 11 women each so in total 33 um what i realized is that to be able to raise funds from the government we mm-hmm. needed to form a producer group okay. and a producer group needs to have minimum of 33 people and so for us the math worked out except the sg groups weren't really talking to each other and they hadn't been established as a producer group so that was my first biggest challenge which was to make sure women communicate with each other and you know there's a consensus and agreement and a spirit to want to work together because it shouldn't just be for you know getting a producer group made it has to continue after i'm gone it it has to continue by itself organically um so those conversations were difficult but quite frankly it's a running theme but i think kids really help because you know even if the women are not talking to each other their kids are playing with each other they are mm-hmm. going to the same school they are being taught by the same uh, teachers so those experiences really help cement relationships a little bit mm-hmm. we used to go there we used to play all the time with kids the you know their mothers would come they would get to interact with each other so i, I would say there were there were touch points like these which helped cement relationships uh, but there was one precedent of you know one of the sg groups she was the oldest woman there and she really had a vision she saw the you know heights or she she saw the new wave that was coming in with other villages also so for instance there was a village close by called terobo there women used to make jhadu okay. and again like as something they did it in their homes but soon they started exporting it jhadu is left from that village and went outside india Crazy. and so so she and she didn't know like how how it came to being but she thought that okay maybe the stepping stone to success is by like at least uniting as a village mm-hmm. and so she i was so happy to have you know understood her perspective where i requested her to kind of take the lead i said that okay now women have started talking to each other why don't you mm-hmm. seal the deal and long story short she got like the women together um and then one day in the evening when i had gone for a meeting all of them said that you know we want to try making these soaps um and let's pitch for funding and because i had learned odisha oh sorry i had learned odia by that time it was easy for me to speak to government officials cuz the language was not a barrier and then from a pitching perspective i had a good idea of like how these soaps could be made we had piloted it we had used it we also had a market ready we knew the you know what the business uh, framework could be the market was been. the schools the tribal yeah. residential schools but there were six in that vicinity alone but there were many all across odisha so it could either be one venture scaling up or it could also be pockets of different sgs across odisha Reason doing this life. and of course like with governments you can speak about you know the vision and mission for the future how this soap could lead to other products could lead to an increase in income could lead to a whole you know change in the landscape of these rural areas with women of course you don't want to overwhelm them with these dreams also they may not be their dreams so you you don't want to pitch it too soon but to at least get the initial funding from government and to show that we have laid the foundation for something and we know it can grow if you provide the support it was important to pitch that that dream and that you know so all this while like till yeah. now 
did you like already name the no. soap? <laughs> no, that's such a how funny did, story. Yeah, I would want so, to know how Angai came into being and what's the meaning of Angai. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a very heartwarming story. So we hadn't named the soap, uh, and <laughs> when we established the producer group, because you have to remember, they, these were three SGs coming together, each with their own names. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of politics around, okay, what will the collective name be? Mm-hmm. So I'll spare you the story, but the name of the producer group was Ma Jagat Janni Mahila Mohasanga. Okay. That was the name of the 33 the women. Twisted, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. What, what's the name? <laughs> I can I can So it, it, yeah, it was basically that big of a name. And then when we started making soaps, we, we again like, you know, established a recipe everyone liked and they were very dirty white in color and the size that we were making were like my palm size maybe. Mm. And so one day we're like, okay, we we got the funding from Odisha Livelihood Mission for this. Um, was which it was, an easy process or? Um, it was, I would say, I was lucky again because of the relationships mm. I built in my time there. Uh, but there was this one PMRDF fellow, his name was Prakash Kumar Sahu. He was really helpful because he was working with the collector at that point. Her name was also Mansi Nimble. Um, and so what really helped was if I had gone through, you know, the direct, the, the normal regular channels, it would have taken me long to even meet the collector. But it was because of him that that happened overnight. And once I met the collector, I had enough trust in the plan we had built. So we had to pitch it to her. Of course, the funding took time to come. but. Ultimately, I wouldn't say it was that difficult a process. It required a lot of pre-work on my side. Um, but I think I got lucky with at least knowing the right people to reach the collector. But the funding had a lot of, for instance, because they knew it was going to be a money-making enterprise. Um, half of it was grant and half of it was a loan that we had to repay back. And we have repaid all loan back with interest now as of today. Uh, But at that point, it was difficult to tell the women because they had never taken a loan and all of that. So that that was also another story because they weren't even literate in maths. So that was a big, big struggle. Um, Coming back to uh, name and that. Yeah. So mom, Jagat Janni Mahila Mahasanga and the soaps, soap was this size. So this one day we go, we make a batch of soaps and uh, we we kept calling it like, you know, Sabun, Sabun and uh, uh, so, sabun is sabun in Odia. Okay. Actually, nahi, this you should cut. I don't know what I'm saying. Okay. Um, so, basically, we used to like make soaps and we would always say like Gadya Bapai, which is like for bathing okay. in, in Odia. So, we would always just call it that. And then um, one day when I was leaving, I was like, okay, we need to, you know, figure out the name of the soap. It was, I think, around 4 p.m., 5 p.m. We were done with the soap Leaving making. as in coming back to Delhi? Or no, no, one day I was, so the village was almost like six kilometers downhill okay. from where I used to live. So I used to go in my Activa mm-hmm. every day. Um, it was a fun ride, except for one day when I got stuck in a storm. Uh, but so four o'clock we finished uh, making soaps for the day they were out drying and i was like okay we have time let's brainstorm a name for the soap and everyone's like the soap name we've already thought of i was like what <laughs> they're like ma'am jagat janni mahila no i was like have you the size of the soap is this much didi like where will we put this name even if we wrap it around it's not going to be enough especially if you write in the odia script mm-hmm. and all and I said, Apko asli me like, and then, you know, we had a really nice, uh, fun discussion on, have you ever been to a shop and ordered ma Jagat Janni Mahila Moha Sangha Sabun Dena? Or have you heard of soap names like that? So then we started asking, like, what all soap names do you know? Everyone only knew Medimix or Lux. Like, those were the only, you know, uh, catchy names at that point. And then we kept thinking and then I, I kind of like asked them, you know, um, in your tribal language, like what are the words that you like or is there anything from your local language you would like to name? Because it's your decision, you're going to own it, you will be known by it um, and all of that. And they're like, Nahi, didi, no one, no one would really like the sound of any of those. And then as they were discussing that, they started talking in, you know, Sora, which I couldn't catch. I can't like. I don't understand full Sora, of course. And then they kept discussing and I, I wanted it to take its own course. So I was also sitting, thinking, kids came in, we started playing and soon, like, you know, it was almost like evening and there was moon in the sky. 
and this kid runs like to his mom and he's like angaita and of course because we were only thinking about soap names everyone anything anyone said we were trying to relate it to the soap and i was like that what does that mean and then um, the lady told me it means the moon in the tribal language of sora angai and i was like our soaps are also dirty white in color didi mm-hmm. like do you think we can name our soaps angai and they thought about it and then everyone started saying and then they're like you know give us some time we'll <laughs> think about it and the next morning i came and they had beautifully printed the name angai on like you know one of the um, buildings and they're like didi we'll keep this name Sweet. and uh, and we kept angai and um, later i remember when we once spoke about it um we realized that the word angai exists in marathi also it means lullaby it exists in kannada also it means the palm of your hand mm-hmm. and it exists in sora which means the moon and we didn't know this there's a serendipity in that huh? like everything yeah. matched yeah mm-hmm. connecting the dots yeah so how much of your eco honors mm. knowledge came into play while you know helping this social don't enterprise don't ask that question <laughs> <laughs> um i don't know it's i i feel that there's never one stream of knowledge that can you know um be enough to create anything it has to be things you've learned from like different walks of life and things you are you know learning on the spot and all of that so i would say the core economic honors that i learned at srcc it helped me when i was thinking about like the business plan etc mm. which now in hindsight because i have this gift of hindsight was mm. a very small part of the bigger experience right. so this is not to like you know discount everything that i learned in my time at srcc but i think it was more the learnings that i you know i learned while in odisha from the you know the people who were working in the ngo from the kids who we were living with from the other locals who would frequent the you know shops we would have breakfast at it was like chitter bitter things it was that very organic bottom up and more of building human relations first than a business yeah yeah so because quite frankly had we scaled up angai which you know is another story because we didn't we we didn't define success for it you know to be a full fledged scale up success for us was defined we defined success as you know women daring to take a step to do something for themselves that was success for us so if angai scaled up only in the rural areas that in it, in itself was you know um an accomplishment for the women the fact that they got out of their house to sell the soaps by you know singing jingles and what not presenting it in government meetings and odisha that was success so had we explored the other route which was like you know actually making a full on business model which also could have been another way of looking at success maybe my eco honors knowledge would have come in handy there more but here it was it was more about like human and social development and yeah 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 that's a question it must have been a beautiful uh, journey and but i think your fellowship was for a limited time i think 11 yeah so months. that's the thing i definitely it was beautiful but i would say it was colorful more mm-hmm. because it had all shades mm-hmm. black white gray to all the colorful shades mm-hmm. of like green mm-hmm. yellow orange and what i mean by that is that you know when you treasure memories of moments that have left a deep impact on you you filter and remember like you know what matters mm-hmm. the most um but when we were setting all this up there were lot of struggles and there were um lot of like dejections along the way also um i think for me the biggest was not in my time there because i had gone with such an open mind but it was actually towards the end mm-hmm. when i had to like bid farewell because my one of the reasons of doing the fellowship was also because i knew i wanted to enter the development sector but i didn't know what it was about mm. like i read blogs sure i you know read people's accounts but i hadn't experienced or witnessed it you know first hand and so i thought if i do this fellowship i'll be more convinced if is it the routine of life i see for the rest of 
the life for myself and I got convinced uh, and so I wanted to apply to study more because I knew like you know staying here is not going because I like I said the soap thing I taught myself but I didn't think I had enough knowledge at that point or even the confidence to kind of like take it you know uh, end to end. So I think once you uh, scale some mountain or hill that you set hmm. to scale in life you don't sit there, right? You come down and find maybe new things to do or maybe new things to explore. Yeah, but that's the whole thing about like attachment and detachment. Like right. just because I served my purpose there, was it enough to just leave mm. as soon as, you know, my yeah. purpose was served? Because I knew like the entire format of this fellowship. For the women, I was just Mansi who had mm. come there, you know, for work. And as we built Angai together, I don't, I think somewhere down the line, they forgot that I will leave one day. Mm. And that became very apparent towards like the end. And even I did, it was one of the most emotional goodbyes. But that was actually where I realized that I need to continue this mm. somehow. Um, but I applied for my master's uh, to Graduate Institute Geneva, among other colleges. And I got through them. And, and before that, I think you... I remember meeting you during this time when you were at this cro that crossroad again. Hmm. Now what to do and where to apply. Hmm. And uh, I think you had brought some children with you also from the yeah. village. Uh, yeah, you met them. I didn't meet them okay. but you told me about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what was that story and how <laughs> was that experience? So that was, um, it was basically towards the end of my fellowship when I decided that, you know, I, I want to study further hmm. and I applied and I got through mm -hmm. and I got a full scholarship to Graduate Institute Geneva. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I told you, right, like we weren't earning enough, like 13,000 a month. So, and my parents also, quite frankly, they were emotionally and mentally supportive. But financially, they said that, you know, we can't afford an education mm -hmm. abroad and all. And even in my head, I knew I'd only go if I get a full scholarship. Otherwise, I wouldn't. And I'd never gone out of India ever. Mm -hmm. So when I... And it's so funny because there's no internet there um, and we couldn't always go to Parlekha Mundi. We used to go to this nearby hill on the top and then try to catch internet from Andhra Pradesh, not even Odisha, the okay. nearby state. And I remember I got like, you know, the my email and the page was loading like this. <laughs> so it said, okay, you got selected. I was like, okay, I still can't go. Okay, you got the scholarship. Okay, I still can't go. Okay, it's a full scholarship. Amazing. So then when I got to know that, I suddenly felt rich, to be very honest. And I felt that, you know, I have, there's so much I can do now because I don't have a financial pressure on myself, at least for the next two years, mm -hmm. because the scholarship was generous. So at that point, I actually pitched to the school that we were in that why don't we take all the kids of class 7th, 8th because the school was only till 8th and I couldn't take responsibility of younger kids. Mm -hmm. But why don't we give them exposure, like make a trip to Delhi, mm -hmm. you know, like how we used to have trips yeah. here and there right. to see museums and whatnot. And these kids had never even left their village. Mm -hmm. They'd never even gone to Bhubaneswar. So I said it would be good for them to like, you know, get out and that conversation didn't really fully kind of materialize because they were there were a lot of constraints basically um, but because I was teaching class 8 students I I just asked them like you know would you like to and all of that and two of them Alpiyash and Biswanath they actually came back to me the next day they were like we've spoken to our parents our parents are okay here are our bags let's go <laughs> and I was like okay easy and then I basically planned this entire trip for just the two of them um so when i was leaving um they basically we made a trip and we came back to odisha and then i left the fellowship uh but basically both of them uh traveled with me from odisha to delhi and then we also went to agra so they stayed with me and like my parents at our place and we visited a bunch of you know places in delhi that they had read about in their textbooks mm. um and it was it was a very surreal experience because at that point they didn't speak english or hindi they only spoke odia mm. and it's interesting but because they were kids i guess um mm. how i organically learned odia by being there they learned hindi because my parents and my brother didn't speak hindi mm. uh, didn't speak odia and there were, of course, I wanted to be with them all the time, but because they spent almost 15-20 days with me, 
it was not possible like you know i would go out to do my things and mm. so they were exposed to my parents and my brother and so they also like picked up hindi mm. um which was good but it's interesting because both of them were also very different um and i think one of alpiash was extremely adventurous so he would always want to be like oh teach me how to drive a car and like all of that alpia uh, biswanath on the other side he really i think was very educationally inclined so he when we would go for walks he would like look at things and be like oh so what are they doing oh is that a job oh what do you have to study to do that so he was like assimilating all this information and the city is such a complex system if we just take a walk right now everything is a business or an right. earning you know there's a potential to earn and you don't get that in the village right because in village you can count on your hands Landscape the number totally of land is totally different exactly. so many layers exactly uh, yeah. and one could get overwhelmed you know if just left by themselves which i'm pretty sure happens with a lot of mm. people when they come to the city for the first time um but with alpiash it was it was very interesting also for me to like relook delhi through his perspective mm. um and yeah that was that was really that nice. happens with us also right now after like moving to a rural area and start thinking from their perspective mm. and how they think about cities mm. like in our village also where we live they don't call it city they call it the plains because <laughs> we supposedly live in the hills yeah. and so they like our plains mein to aisa hota hai aisa hota hai and then so when we also come back like i came back after 6 months now i literally now see city in a different way earlier what we take for granted hmm. you start seeing those different layers you know you if you see somebody who has just created a informal shop you can hmm. maybe i can relate it to the village like how they were already you know making such ephemeral hmm. structures within their villages hmm. because for us this same something like which we won't do but like for them they know you know like all those jugad and stuff and mm. but i think they're very much adaptable uh, when they come to the city and but yeah, i'm sure like somebody who's coming for the first time it must be yeah. an overwhelming experience yeah so much to consume he i remember because uh, biswanath uh, he was from the village muni singh and we had gone there and the, the, his family used to cultivate um, pineapples and and mm. mangoes and they had huge farms of pineapples and there's apparently a rani pineapple which grows in the middle and is supposed to be the sweetest and every time we went they would you know serve us that and uh, <laughs> because we were there for 20 days and bisnath goes like these where are the fields here <laughs> and i was like i'm sorry they don't exist here um and i took him to city fort and then i you know few areas here and there but yeah I think it's interesting but as much as they loved it they were also done by the end of it they like they wanted to go back and um the good thing just because we spoke about Biswanath is that it's extremely touching that he really really changed his life um you know from the time like I knew him back in school he would like I said they would only speak odia and um, sora mm-hmm. now he speaks hindi he speaks english he it's and it's not about the language it's about him you know inviting those opportunities to learn because no one in his family still does and he's gotten an education now he you know went to parlekha mundi to do his college he is constantly in touch with me he kind of you know keeps asking for instance oh i want to get this laptop and i'm trying to raise funds like this and we were able to also support him to you know um, mm. get the means he required to have like a full holistic education and today he's um, he's a master coder he oh does then i even don't know what he does but it's called central ethical hacking apparently um so he's become a hacker <laughs> uh, computers but yeah So yeah, I think I met you during that time only when you might have returned from the fellowship, and I don't know which year would it be. Uh, twenty fifteen. Yeah. So yeah. I was really inspired by your experience. Like you didn't tell me much about Angai and everything, but just the whole idea about you know going to rural area and be of some help. Hmm. Going back uh, to the. timeline now mm. you finished your uh, fellowship and so how was your experience in geneva and what was the course about and 
uh, how did you take uh, angai with you there or like how were you managing it from there what was the situation um so i my course is for 2 years mm-hmm. um but it's cuz i didn't want to leave um you know or is i think i definitely felt a little guilty mm-hmm. um the enterprise was established we were you know making money we were selling soaps but i knew that it takes way more than a year to build a habit mm-hmm. or to like you know fully become independent in running mm-hmm. a system like that so i knew the women needed support uh, my first thing was to kind of you know get like the government's buy in and all of that but long story short i felt like we weren't done like the story mm-hmm. hadn't ended there so i stayed there till my last day i remember i came back to delhi only for a week and i not even a week weekend i think and then i left for geneva so my transition was very abrupt and so i remember like the first person i called when i reached was ninoshka only <laughs> in odisha and i was like it's the sheer contrast of like going from odisha to switzerland was it it was strange it was very strange um dependent on you know it it really depends on do you think like okay mansi as an individual mansi as a student mansi as a development practitioner like what personality you want to assume and depending on that it's either a good or a bad experience quite frankly um so it, it was very mixed so my initial days in geneva were very i think torn and i i wasn't fully because all my habits of the way i spoke to people how i ate my food how i was was all acclimatized to you know um a village lifestyle and very organically and naturally so i didn't do it to put up a show or anything yes. so it was very difficult to remove all of that and then now you know become a, a citizen or like a member of geneva polish yeah so yeah it was bizarre the yeah. thing was bizarre but at the same time i chose a course i would say that always you know reminded me of odisha because my course was masters in development studies and i specialized in human and social development specialized uh but so all the modules that we had um you know be it through the lens of econometrics anthropology peace and conflict it was all about like building resilience it was about how you know humanity like as a race has kind of you know um, evolved and how still there are like pockets like the rural areas where you know they don't have access to services and just understanding that in a very global uh, level and trying to um, you know figure the different approaches of development to solve like these different problems because even if you see like the way we do things in india is not the same as you know what we may do in africa okay you can delete this but basically it really exposed us to the different approaches of development so in that way i think um, every course i did i would look back at okay what have i learned and can this be applied to angai mm-hmm. which for me actually made my experiential education really holistic because i wasn't just absorbing something to pass an exam but i already had something i was applying it to at the back of my head right. and interestingly i always say this but the reason why i also feel guilty is cuz i feel i only got the scholarship because of my experience with angai everything that i feel i learned there the personality that was gifted to me by the women in mm-hmm. by them opening themselves to me just led me to this opportunity to so, so there was always this need desire to you know give, give back, back. Yeah. yeah um and i was always in touch with them and the enterprise was continuing what was a very romantic reminder also was that in my last semester in the course um we could opt for something called an applied research seminar wherein you actually work with an ngo very similar to the fellowship that i did except in a shorter time frame so 6 months um and i got the opportunity to work with this french ngo uh, called lagrad mm-hmm. um that was operating out of burkina faso now there's a whole like you know political angle to it because there are a lot of french ngos still in africa and so i had my inhibitions on if it's like some weird recolonization happening or not but um when i met the people like who were running this ngo um 
one man he was like he was 93 year old man who was running this ngo and they had basically been working in burkina faso for 40 45 years um in trying to understand how the country copes up with the dry season so burkina faso 8 out of 12 months there's the dry season in burkina faso and the primary activity is it like can you paint yeah. a brief picture about burkina faso it's like demographics and oh i don't think i'll be able <laughs> to do a good job but burkina faso in the history of the world has been one of the poorest countries in the mm-hmm. world uh, the capital of burkina faso is ouagadougou mm-hmm. um recently there was also this coup that happened i don't know okay. if you know yeah. um but yeah it's a place of unrest um and it's a primarily it's an agrarian economy um so even though it's an agrarian economy it you know undergoes 8 out of 12 uh, seasons 8 uh, out of 12 months in the year um kya bol rahe ha so it's an agrarian economy but 8 out of 12 months they basically undergo the dry season um, hmm. of agriculture so there's you know not much so growing was it the case like uh soon history or like this is something very recent that um, has happening that has been happening. no it's it's always been the case there have been um you know efforts to curb it but then there's there've been setbacks but it has kind of been an accepted fate almost okay uh, the dry season is pretty chronic there um and so my two f- so basically there were three of us me and two of my friends um we got selected by this ngo to you know go work in burkina faso and they had been working in burkina faso for the last 40 45 years in trying to just decipher or understand the nature of the dry season what it is when it comes how does it impact the people um and having worked through these 40 years they basically developed three pillars um from which to approach this problem so one was ecological like can you come up with agro you know ecological techniques to kind of grow crops in the dry season second was political which was um, can the government come up with schemes or like you know um, more employment opportunities in this time to support the population and the third pillar was um, how do we deal with vulnerable groups like women and children mm. so my friends like the two of my colleagues they took care of the first and the second pillar and i was researching on the third pillar which is how can you know vulnerable population survive because one of the interesting trends in burkina faso was that during the dry season most of the men would migrate out of the country but the women and children would be left behind so they would still migrate out and then you know bring income back but that season they weren't really like living or experiencing it uh but the women and children were so our brief was basically and this is what drew me to the project was that our um, you know benoit lecomte that was the name of the the man who ran the ngo he basically said we've done a lot in the last 40 years with a certain generation of people in trying to change their mindsets now we want three of you to go there and actually interview their second and third generations to see if that perception change mm-hmm. that we were able to see it has it trickled down or not and that to me was so interesting because they had been tracking families basically for years to see that we taught you these you know agro ecological techniques or you know introduced you um uh, to some government schemes that could be mapped brought in a change with the the government how has been it how has it been percolating down the generations and so we went there um we 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 split our time in wagadougou which is the capital and waiguya where i went alone um and waiguya is like a small village um and the same thing it was like coming back to square one because in odisha also no one spoke you know um hindi and here i was in wagadougou where no one spoke english mm. you could only converse in french and i don't think i learned as much french in geneva as i did in my time in in burkina faso and then when i went to waiguya which was the village i they didn't even french was limited they would speak more there was the moray tribe there uh, and so they would speak their tribal language um anyway when i went to waiguya um i basically had gotten in touch with some of these cooperatives that you know had developed in the last few years in as like means of alternative income um you know during Apart the dry season farming, yeah. yeah yeah 
Um, and the first cooperative I visited was a soap making cooperative. <laughs> and they were making soaps out of karité, uh, which is basically Shia butter um, okay. in French. And I'm pretty sure it's pronounced different. So, uh, but in Burkina Faso, their French diction was also very like au revoir and bonjour. So they used to call it karité. And it was, it was such a, it was, it was a moment where, because I had no idea, like, you know, I just knew I'm going to go meet a cooperative and then I entered and I like, I start noticing these features as like, they are making soaps. And then I finally, you know, I met them, I interviewed them and even in their entire journey of how they got together was very similar and I told them about Angai and then I sent them soaps from Angai when I got back, which is a very long this thing but um, yeah, so it's interesting uh, we didn't come to a conclusive result because I feel we were just part of the entire process and that this project will continue on for long but it was interesting because my own I, I was basically traveling with a translator because I didn't understand the tribal language but it was through him and through some of the interviews we did that we realized that the younger generation definitely like realizes the potential not just Burkina Faso but Africa as a continent has. What were your like key takeaways apart from the technical learning that you had like from Burkina Faso? What were the parallels did you draw and and now I think after Burkina Faso you're coming back again to the crossroads, right? Like yeah. what to do next? So life is full of crossroads. Yeah. yeah. So how did you go about that? I think um what I have learned is that everything is connected. Uh, every and I would say, and I think a lot of us would believe that. Mm. Um, and so, my time in Burkina Faso, I think the same thing about my sensation of time always gets challenged when you know I go to such places. And I I don't think like if I look back in life, some of my most productive times. It has to be Odessa and Burkina Faso because in such a small time I was exposed to so much um, there and then I moved back to India to work with this um, organization called Good Business Lab and at that point it was just a startup. Um, so I remember was we were in 2018? 2017, 17. end October 2017, just like three, five of us in the organization and um, I've been there since so not not had many crossroads mm -hmm. since that. I have maybe in personal life, but professionally, I think I, I found a good space um, in Good Business Lab. And I think you are a really good example, like what I could see from an external perspective of, I won't say work-life balance, but life-work balance. Mm -hmm. And uh, so even living in a city like Delhi, so mm -hmm. you're a great example of how you can live a life intentionally, right? And inculcate new hobbies because I have been in touch with you and every time I talk to you, maybe you're trying to cook a bread and mm. maybe learning piano. Mm. And so like, how do you see yourself uh, maybe creating that balance and why do you think that you did it in the first place? And so you, I remember you telling me that you are more of a generalist, right? So what does being a generalist mean to you? Um, I think one thing is that I never say no to an opportunity to learn. Mm. Um, and of course, we can go seek out things like, oh, I like piano, I want to learn piano. But there are sometimes you don't invite opportunities, but they come your way. Like mm. I had moved back to Jaipur for a bit and you know, got to know about this master artisan who lived in a village close by, was teaching block printing and through someone like I never thought in my life I would go there. But that's just one of the many examples of how I think I've been alert to opportunities of learning that have come my way and just never said no, because I think there are great coincidences that may or may not happen again. And what these learnings have kind of, you know, taught me is that whenever you're trying to really like understand something or go too in depth you know it could be that you know you get stuck or you don't understand but in moments like that for me when I've withdrawn from it and done something else 
there have been eureka moments which have helped me understand the previous activity better okay. and that to me is almost like you know drawing patterns i think even in school it's interesting but i realized that my way of learning was by drawing patterns in things or like finding metaphors or parallels here yeah. and there like i remember i used to read <coughs> science books like story books because i used to love reading english story books and of course i understood the rationale behind it or so i think but it that perspective made it easier for me because i wasn't reading it as science i was reading it as characters with atoms molecules right. and things like that and so this you know everyone also talks about this approach of like unlearning relearning learning and all of that and i think that's a great approach to keep your mind very um, agile True. very adaptable to you know um, like starting from scratch because whenever you learn something new it's child like mind yeah you whenever you learn something new you're allowing yourself to be in that vulnerable position of starting from not knowing anything to going mm-hmm. to somewhere you know something right and that is i think a great challenge to put your mind through again and again and also to like remind yourself that you know there's so much to learn and there are so many people to learn from so in that way i feel a generalist approach to life helps me have a more holistic life and a more wholesome life and that has allowed me to like invite different kinds of activities which you know um and also friends like you <laughs> and many others who you know bring new stories and then new opportunities so you the key theme that we've been discussing is a sense of time right hmm. and how it change when I, when you are in rural areas and <coughs> so yuval noah harari also talks about this thing about time and evolution in his books that when like as a civilization we are evolving and since agriculture you know like you started agriculture so that we could have more time in life right mm. and as as and when the technology is you know uh, coming in and it is becoming omnipresent mm. and also with a job like you know we always have this excuse mm. that time you we don't have time anymore right That's so like. so yeah and you are an example of that so how do you create that time in life maybe to because i know you've been going to rock climbing or maybe attending pottery classes or you know learning new things or what do you say like on the piano and maybe baking like inculcating hobbies at baking maybe stitching your own clothes also so how do you create that time because i'm sure a lot of people who are listening are struggling on that for sure <laughs> oh I don't think anyone has time one has to make time right. I think that's a big mind set change everyone needs to have because it's a common resource we share right, right. and um, how do I do it it's just I think one thing I like my father doesn't work he's you know he's he's I think he left it's been 10 years or more than that he's not been working and he's at home and um he's of course like fathers our fathers are a certain age so he's also in his late 60s i think um and it's interesting but like you know whenever i try to like introduce something new to him he always says that ab kahan ab to matlab you know and i understand that also but it's so interesting and that's why the whole sensation of time picture kind of comes in but and a lot of like speak motivational speakers have also spoken about it that you always have enough time to learn anything you want so the thing is i think we pressurize ourselves into thinking that oh if you want to learn something we have to ace it or we have to become a specialist in it and that's where i think i i disagree with that for me the pleasure is just in the process in the it's not even in the process it's in letting yourself um you know embark on that journey and like see what happens so my aim let's say when i'm learning pottery it's not to make the next best ceramic item mm. but it's just to like interact with that object see if i you know how is it making me a more patient person is it so it's not really directly the hard skills that you learn mm. from a certain activity it's the soft skills So sometimes you know for you as an outsider you may look like oh man see is stitching her own clothes 
but for me it's not that act of stitching it's just time with myself i'm thinking about something and that activity is so that is the meditative uh, yeah and so we do a lot of things we spend our time doing a lot of things that are not always productive but they are satisfying and so for me a lot of the activities that you outline i my attitude to doing them is not to be able to produce something mm-hmm. but it is to like i find it calming yeah. so i do not have a recommendation of like how one should do it but i would just say that if one can be alert to oneself like you know what makes you happy and th- this is easier said than done but if you're alert to who you are and to what you know exists around you and you're able to match mm-hmm. like what you want to do to what is available i think that is the first step in at least clearing your head of like you know how you want to go forward in life and then reducing the inertia to like starting something new has to just in my head it comes from reducing your own expectations of why you are doing something so you i'm not studying a masters to get the best job i'm studying the masters to maybe meet people and learn something so it's it's just changing the perspective of the end outcome which makes or to me at least reduces the friction or inertia to starting new things and for me i really think that i i love doing things with my hands and and so that's why a lot of the things like cooking baking and i can resonate with you on that and maybe i formed a theory for myself on that also what is happiness in a way so yeah. i think happiness is very overrated now and it is something that you cannot answer and once you try to you know articulate it it ceases to exist but mm. when you do such activities mm. like maybe pottery or you playing piano you are so much into it in the present that the state of flow if i can call it that during that process you are in a state of thoughtlessness you know mm. like generally if you are sitting alone with yourself a lot of thoughts coming in maybe anxiety can come into picture but during that process you are in a state of flow and maybe that is the satisfaction when the you know, looks for life so, so now like if i ask you again like in right now in your life situation what are some conflicts that you are having with yourself i, I think the biggest journey is just like i always say this as selfish as it may sound it is understanding yourself um and i sometimes feel that i don't fully recognize myself or i you know change too quickly for myself only to keep you know pace with myself um so in that way i think there's a lot of flux um what was good when i was you know living in rural areas um and I, we need to find a better term i just don't like sectioning them as rural areas but yeah when i was living in the countryside was that i for some reason like my mental state was more balanced there maybe because there was not you know the va- the number of variables in the environment weren't that many mm. um and it's interesting but you can't always control your physical space but you can i would like to think control your mental space so i sometimes always like even when we are we were talking right now for moments i try to like think and remember my mindset and try to like grip it from back in that time and bring it in the present so for me the ultimate challenge is if i can somehow like you know maintain that like state of mental balance which is unperturbed by my circumstances that would be great and that sounds very saintly um because even now i realize like when i was in odisha um prob- and you know we would have like challenges or or problems I, somehow my attitude to that was not like you know to get bogged down or be, get worried but it was automatically jump to like problem solving because maybe because it was the constraint of time maybe because i thought i was accountable to a lot of people maybe it was age i don't know but i clearly remember there not being a single day where i was like taken like my spirits were you know down or i was disheartened um and somehow that's i've not been able to like retain that because there are moments like if i can just look back in the last 2 years where i've really felt like you know i've lost control of myself or i didn't know you know what to do next and 
it's interesting but designing my life to have different activities like piano or you know pottery they help me center myself if you learn pottery one of the first things they teach you is how to center the clay and that whole, whole process and uh, i'm not a professional potter but that whole process is about really understanding the clay understanding how its weight is distributed understanding how much water it needs what the speed of the wheel should be how much should you press it so that it can come in the center and if there could be a metaphor drawn that's what i'm trying to do with my mind where i feel because life offers you so much um that you know your mind is always like a uncentered pot of clay and it's only through the pressures you put but you know yourself towards your life it's through the water which could be you know there could be metaphors but i feel through the different activities through the people i meet i'm really trying to center my mind at the end of the day um and i just think about that like i don't think about uh i don't come from a very financially sound family and i think that's really affected for the longest time my perspective on everything i did that oh but you know how will we figure out finances even when i was applying for college that's why my parents said that um i remember my father said pair utni felani chahiye jitni chadar hoti hai which and I, i i and i refused to understand the meaning of that because i was like if i understand it it's going to stick with me and because my point being that lot of you know things have happened in life which has made my perspective a certain way which was so permanent till recently where i was like i need to challenge this so yes i want to have a comfortable living but my definition of comfort has changed or the amount of risk i would like to take you know um has also like kind of evolved so right now i think to me all that matters is with my work with my job with my activities with friends like you everything at the end of the day is my mind centered and this sounds like a very vague metaphor no, but but that is such a beautiful analogy about like centering your mind and mm. there like i think that's a beautiful way to end this podcast and it was because i have nothing more to share now <laughs> so there is so much to learn from your successes failures and experiences and i'm so glad that you agreed to come on the podcast thank you once again thank you so much but i also feel the point is not to necessarily learn from this podcast even if we have like i don't know some nice time with friends listening to it that's all thank you for listening please consider sharing it with your friends